Aloha and welcome to the Spring 2023 edition of UHM TV, a TV magazine show written, hosted, and produced by journalism students at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm Hi'ilave Nevis. And I'm Kalavai Anunez. Mahalo for joining us from our College of Social Sciences Digital Studios. Coming up in this episode, find out how the old ways of Ololo Hawaii are being revitalized through social media. South Shore surfers celebrate a big win after keeping free parking privileges at the Alawai Harbor. Learn how UH's Hawaiian flora and fauna are adding to the educational experience on campus. Plus, an exclusive talk story session with one of UH's first Okinawan scholars, longtime educator and proud alum, Miyoko Hata. All this and more on UHM TV. One of the highlights of the University of Hawaii's 10-year strategic plan is to help renormalize Olalo Hawaii. As a declared Hawaiian place of learning, UH strives to expand the use of the native language on campus, and many Kumu are hoping to do that by expanding talk story sessions outside the classroom. Every semester, the Hawaiian Language Department hosts a social event to encourage UH students to make new friends and speak Ōlelo Hawaii in the real world. When I was growing up, you never hear too much kanaka outside of different communities talking Hawaiian. But now you can hear them hear Ōlelo all over. You hear them in schools, you hear people scolding their kids in a, in a shopping center. So you get plenty more places that, that Hawaiian is more widespread and more normalized. In 2022, the state legislature passed a resolution apologizing for banning the use of Ōlelo Hawaii in public schools. The prohibition was implemented soon after the overthrow of the monarchy and lasting nearly a hundred years. But I mean, historically, because like of the ban and because of accessibility issues, like many Hawaiians do not speak Hawaiian and nobody should be shamed for that. Nobody should be shamed for not being able to speak their own mother tongue, especially when it's because of like colonization. Mahope o ka ho'o kapu o na ho'ole i ka mo'o meheo. Mau no a holo mua ka hana ho'olu o ka o'lelo Hawaii. What is your name? Lilia? No, we're not having Hawaiian names in this. Your name is Lydia. Say Lydia. In the early 90s to the 2000s, a television show called Mana Leo aired on O'lelo TV, a talk show format where native speakers came together to talk about all things Hawaiian with no English subtitles. Today, influencers like Malu States use Ōlelo Hawaii to educate students in new and modern ways through social media. Say that, like, like. Okay, now you say it twice, yeah? Like, 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 like. I mean, our, like a parent's generation, grandparent's generation, didn't have the, the opportunities that we have. They also didn't have any of the encouragement or support, obviously, I mean, they were, the language and cultural suppression was at its peak in my like grandfather's generation. So it's, it's pretty amazing that, I mean, I can do what I do. In the 1960s, Hawaiian middle names were extremely popular in Hawaii. And it wasn't until the early 2000s that this changed. In 2001, 25% of newborn girls and 15% of newborn boys were given Hawaiian first names. Like growing up, I mean, I had kids that that I grew up with that had like their first names being Hawaiian names. But I know a lot of a lot of Keikis had their middle names as their Hawaiian names. First names was was Haole. Um, and the reasoning for that was because was it very Maika'i to to show your Hawaiian-ness and to be on Hawaiian because everybody was trying to assimilate with America. And now there's more of a more Kanaka or more Na'awa and educated and more awake, you know, more people are, are embracing their Hawaiian side and naming their children Hawaiian names. When I grow up speaking English and my first words are all in English, then my wife and I, same thing, right? We're both speaking English growing up. When our daughter's first words are in Hawaiian, it's like, I don't have any word to express what that's like, but I have a, a sense of pride of what we've been able to accomplish, of what once was taken has now been reclaimed and established in our house and in our family. And that's something that, again, I can't explain, but I, it's priceless. Although there is still much work to be done to truly renormalize Ōlelo Hawaii, many remain hopeful for that future. 
I mean, where else better for speak Hawaiian than Hawaii? I'm. So that is my my kahuhopu, my iini, my my desire. My dream is to one day just have one whole world that everybody ola Hawaii. Eola ka ola Hawaii. The Hawaiian language lives on. And for UHM TV, I'm Hi'i Lave Nevis. It's great to see the Kumu get the recognition they deserve. I agree. A big mahalo to all of our Kumu who have helped us learn the language. While the number of Hawaiian speakers are growing on campus, so is the number of women in esports. As Shelby Matos tells us, female gamers are finding a place in the typically male-dominated virtual world. Most college students play video games, and UH Esports is creating equal opportunities for women to enter the esports scene. This year, students established Women of UH Esports. Well, I saw a kind of need for more support for marginalized genders, including um, myself and my friends. According to a 2020 survey by Statista, a quarter of women stopped playing video games because of gender-based harassment. There's a lot of them were afraid to stand up for themselves or felt unsafe or didn't feel comfortable in the esports environment and we just want to change that. While there's no way of quantifying the genders of UH Esports members, Women of UH Esports is creating a space for women to play video games and get involved behind the scenes. This is going to be my first time casting, so please don't have high expectations for me. Marissa's a pro, so I'm going to just cry while she does a lot of talking. Because even if the viewers can't see that it's led by women, it makes a really big difference, or even just like marginalized genders. Because all the people participating in our tournament could visually see these are the people in charge. Just I think being able to see people in those positions really helps. While we want to support students in uh, playing in competitions, playing with their friends, the important part for me is to pave pathways for these students to get into industry. On top of hosting tournaments, Women of UH Esports hosts podcasts where students have the opportunity to chat and connect with esports professionals. What I love about that is it's all about showcasing the women that have made it in this scene the stories that they can share. I think that's what really helps with student success because you, you want to see people like you uh, make it in the scene. When you hear those stories and how they overcame it, it gives you a little bit of hope. For UHM TV, I'm Shelby Matos. So Shelby, what are the next steps to growing the program? I'm standing in the iLab, which is home to the UH Esports program. As the semester comes to an end, Women of UH Esports is looking forward to creating more events for students to enjoy next year. Thanks, Shelby. When we come back, how Honolulu Community College is helping extinguish a shortage in Hawaii's firefighters. Plus, a close-up look at the famous artwork of a treasured UH alum. These stories and much more on UHM TV when we return. Welcome back to UHM TV. A recent shortage in Honolulu firefighters is sparking a new generation of first responders. As Donovan Kirkwaza reports, Honolulu Community College is blazing a new trail in the fire sciences. Future first responders are dousing the flames of Hawaii's current firefighter shortage. According to a Civil Beat article last year, the Honolulu Fire Department reported a 22% vacancy in their workforce. Now, Honolulu Community College is actively training recruits from across the state in hopes of rescuing Hawaii from its ongoing crisis. HCC's fire science program offers students college credit and certification in multiple areas, including fire rescue, hazardous material training, and emergency medical services. My biggest takeaways from the classes that I've been going through is basically like show up and do the work. That's what our chief tells us every single day. If you want it badly, you're gonna work for it and you're gonna do whatever you, you can to get to your goal. Show up and put everything in. The program welcomes all students, including women, 
who've historically been a minority in the firefighting industry. Our last graduating class, we had five females in a class of 27. So that was kind of a proud moment for us. In fact, uh, the, one of the females was a class leader for the, for the class. Our mission is to provide uh, training to get them certified. It's a two-year program and it gives them a foot up, I should say. The fire science program, as I see it, it's a great way for the students to get a glimpse of what life will be like when they go to one of the recruit academies. Confidence is a cornerstone for any student pursuing a career. HEC's fire science program provides their students with the tools and confidence necessary to tackle any fire. It's not an easy class. It's good that you have this opportunity to test the water, see if firefighting is something that you want to do. And if it is, you've come to the right place. I think the real value is they're getting an inside scoop as to what it's going to be like to become a firefighter. I wasn't too sure if I really wanted to do this. And as I went through the program, I can say now confidently that this is what I want to do. HCC plans to offer summer classes and early college opportunities for high school students interested in finding new doorways to their future. For UHM TV, I'm Donovan Turquoise. Ocean lovers are celebrating a recent decision surrounding the Alawai Boat Harbor parking controversy. Beachgoers can rest assured that parking stays free, at least for now. Margaret Cipriano reports. On any given day, the Alawai Small Boat Harbor parking lot is normally full. And it's free, thanks to a recent effort from community advocates to keep it that way. Since 2002, state officials have been actively proposing parking fees at various harbor lots. However, the public outcry was loud enough to keep that from happening. Let's hear a little bit more about this community win. The beach is free, the ocean is free, the parking should be free too for the locals because, hey, this is what we do on the weekends. We're surrounded by ocean, so we should have access to it without it costing us anything. A larger lot surrounding these stalls already charges hourly parking rates for tourist activities. However, locals who surf at the popular Bulls Break believe this portion should always be free. You would just prevent a lot of locals from coming as often as they do. This is part of their, their life. This is tradition. This is not just a place where we come to have fun. It's where we come to meet and fellowship. To me, it's a second church, and I think many others feel the same way. This is where the locals mix with the tourists in a nice, comfortable setting, right by the ocean, million dollar view. If you start making it cost something for that, locals aren't going to come by and the tourists aren't going to get that, that feel of aloha. Probably like top on the list is free parking. Um, parking is just a big thing in Hawaii in general. There's a lot of history, a lot of rich history here, and I think there's more of a hui in the water really makes it so much easier to be able to just pull up into a parking lot, pick a stall, and then be able to go immediately to the water. Keeping these 300 spots free is a huge victory for local ocean lovers. The community is committed to fighting future proposals for paid parking here. We have a community that's strong and uh, courageous to be able to do something like that. And this is something that happens uh, every so often, but I'm so glad that we just come together it's things like that that really bring the community together, so I don't think thank you is enough. Those people that are rallying really are the voice of almost a million of us here in Hawaii um, that love this beach and, and don't want to pay for parking. So for now, locals are just happy to ride this victory wave enjoying free beach access and free parking. For UHM-TV, I'm Margaret Cipriano. So Margaret, what are the chances that this decision might be reversed? A bill to save the remaining free parking stalls at Alawai Small Boat Harbor has stalled, but it could be revisited in 2024. Thanks, Margaret. When we come back, meet a proud UH alum and island treasure, Miyoko Hata. Plus, an inside peek at all these hidden gems on campus. All of this and more on UHM TV. Welcome back to UHM TV. Every semester, we like to honor our UH alumni and learn how the university has shaped their professional and personal lives. Our very own Kaya LaGuardia Yonamine sat down with our featured alumni of the week, Miyoko Hata. Miyoko Hata is a living treasure in Hawaii's Okinawan community. After World War II, she was among the first students from Okinawa to travel to Hawaii on scholarship, graduating with degrees in anthropology and education. 
During her studies, she met her college sweetheart Tommy, and the happy couple has been married for 53 years. She is a retired public school teacher and is actively involved in several Okinawan cultural groups. Today, we are joined by a proud UH alum and longtime educator, Miyoko Hata. Thank you for joining us on UHM TV. Thank you for inviting me, Kaya. What was it like growing up in Ishigaki? Are there any fond memories that you have? Ah, uh, yes. I am one of nine children. I was born right after the war, and Okinawa was devastated under the uh, World War II. It's, it's known as the Battle of Okinawa. So materialistically, we weren't blessed. But our family, we always had laughter and songs in my family. And uh, Ishigaki was a very peaceful country, country place. Going from Okinawa to Hawaii, mm -hmm. why did you choose UH of all places? Oh, it just happened that one day my father was reading a local newspaper and he come, came across the article that this agency is looking for scholarship recipient. And those days, that was unheard of for young high school grad girl to go to abroad to study. I graduated from University of Hawaii. My husband graduated from University of Hawaii. And my son graduated from University of Hawaii. It's, it's part of my life. It's part of our family's life. I understand that mm -hmm. UH is also where you met your husband. Yes. <laughs> Can I hear a little about how you guys met? <laughs> yes. I was living on campus, dormitory. He was living in Manoa. So my friend from dormitory asked me to stay with her. So we had a chat at her house in Waiowa. And that's how I met him. We got married, you know, we just had 50 years of marriage uh, three years ago, so we are blessed. You went from being a student in Hawaii to becoming an educator in Hawaii as well. Mm -hmm. Could I hear a little about that experience for you? I wanted to be an English teacher. That was my dream. I had to drop off my son, teach part-time, and then in the afternoon, go to University of Hawaii to get the education degrees. And even nighttime, I went to school. How do you stay connected to the Okinawan community here in Hawaii? Oh, I am a member of Okanshin Kabudan and Hui O Lao Lima and Gajimaru Kai. <laughs> I get kind of emotional when I think about it. Um, they welcomed me because I don't have any uh, family here except my nuclear family. My parents, my sisters, my everybody, relatives are all in Okinawa. So they embraced me to be part of them. Do you have any words of wisdom for our current UH students or the graduating class of 2023? I want the student who are attending here to get involved with the important things very dear to you. Washta kutuba mamuti, washta bunka mamuti, washta shima mamuti, washta inuchi mamuti. Protect our language, protect our culture, protect our land, and protect our life. Miyoko san, I'm so honored to hear your story, and thank you so much, Skaitu Mifa Yu, for mm. coming into our studio today. And thank you all for joining me on UHM TV. When we come back, we'll feature the work of another UH alum whose art continues to bring life to the state capitol. And how different campus plants can be used in traditional and unique ways. Stay with us on UHM TV. Welcome back to UHM TV. The Hawaii Hand Weavers Hui recently celebrated the work of a distinguished fine artist who earned her degree from UH. Noi Nakatani visited the state capitol and got this exclusive look at her collection. While state lawmakers are busy making laws, not many people may be aware that there's a special piece of art hanging in the background of every legislative session. These tapestries are creations of UH alum Ruth Adele Anderson, who graduated with a fine arts degree in weaving during the 1960s. Recently, the Hawaii Handweavers Hui got a chance to view her collection, which currently decorates the House and Senate chambers of Hawaii's state capital. It was so 
almost breathtaking to see it. I had that sort of opportunity to learn or even have a work of art in such a monumental place such as the Capitol building. Um, so I think it's just a very well-rounded um, communal piece of art. Here at the Downtown Art Center, where the Hui hosts First Friday events, we learned how fiber artists use these classical weaving looms. I like textile work better. I feel like not only does it kind of bring people together, it, it helps you to come back to yourself and it helps you to come back to, you know, traditional ways of making things. According to the Ulu Ulu archives, a project of this magnitude required weavers to create multiple panels of tapestries that were eventually put on display using metal scaffolding. Although the Hui has yet to take on a project as large as Anderson's, a similar undertaking can be found in the heart of the Hui's workshop. This weave is for the first Friday, and it's, it's a sample loom so that um, the community can try it out. So this has just been a collection of um, first Friday events. And um, yeah, it's so people can test out how a floor loom works and they can get a little taste of uh, weaving on a traditional loom. To learn more about the Hawaii Handweavers Hui and other First Friday events, please check out the Hui's website. For UHM TV, I'm Noe Nekotani. Art takes all forms, and sometimes they grow naturally all around us. Just outside our digital studios, you can find a rare and endangered ohi alehua, which happens to be flourishing right here on campus. Students come to the University of Hawaii at Manoa to study many disciplines, such as business, nursing, and STEM-related majors. However, to some people, their studies fall into something more fragrant, plants. Anywhere you walk at the university, you're always accompanied with a luscious green or blooming flower. To many students, the greens are more than greens, the flowers are more than flowers. Growing up, like, with the tree that's in front of my grandma's house, we'd always, like, kuile together. Me and my friends will, like, even, like, at school, we'll come and we'll, like, pick the flowers and we'll make lei. And then at every, like, paina or, like, graduation, anything like that, like, we'd always come with, like, handmade lei. So that's nice that I get to do it with my friends, too. Just a nice way to, like, show them that you care without needing to buy something and it's like a cultural practice as well it allows me to put like my own aloha into it and my own like care for that person into it other plants important to the mo'omehu hawaii would be hala la'i and pohinahina these plants are used for la'olapa'o hanano'eo and lay making all found growing here at the university plants grown here are also used to serve tribute to na mo'i o hawaii the monarchy of hawaii at the Queen Lili'u Okalani Center for Student Services, you can find Pua Kala'unu, crown flower, growing nearby as it was her favorite flower. If you look at most of the plants at the university, they were handpicked to be grown here. Noveo Kai, curator for UHM Campus Arboretum, has been working to enhance and diversify the plant life here at the university. So the Arboretum works to enhance the collection specifically through adding native species, more native species, not only in number, but in diversity. We work with different departments to help, to help make the landscape usable for them, like the outer circle of Varney Circle. Those plantings are part of a tropical plant and soil science researcher, faculty, who is studying different native plants that can be the go-to landscaping native plants. Learning about the plant life here at UHM is a start to land-based learning. Land-based learning is denormalizing Western concepts and approaching education through an indigenized and environmentally focused approach. Land-based learning is learning off the land. When we have uh, groups come in, yeah, I find it to be most memorable when the kids come in, then they learn by their hands and it's a memorable moment. So when you have these memorable moments while learning, you're able to solidify and make those, make those connections to Aina learning. And then when you get back to school, you're able to write it all out and remember what you learned. For UHM TV, I'm Kalavai Anunez.
Just watching your video, I feel like I can smell the flowers straight through the screen. I know, the plumeria is just one of my favorite scents. Well, this wraps up our 31st edition of UHM TV. Mahalo for watching. I'm Kalavai Anunez. And I'm Hi'ilave Nevis. For more information, please visit our YouTube channel. E Malamopono and Aloha. Aloha.